As we approach one year since Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine, I expect that observers around the world are preparing to reflect on where things stand after a year of hard fighting. On the 15th of February, the chairman of the US Joint Chiefs of Staff, Mark Milley, offered his own summary. The general contended that Russia had lost strategically, operationally and tactically. The Ukrainians fighting on in the trenches around Bakhmut. I'm not sure how well the general's words would have reconciled with constant Russian artillery bombardments and attacks that continued day after day. After almost a year of fighting, there is no doubt that the Russian military continues to apply enormous pressure and that it remains capable of slowly grinding forward towards its objectives. But Putin did not launch this war to raise the Russian flag over the destroyed remains of Bakhmut. Putin's war, like most others, was launched to achieve a set of strategic objectives. And while the future of the war in Ukraine or the results of any particular battle are still up for determination, in that strategic respect, Mark Milley's words, I would argue, hold true. By the standards the Russians themselves set, the invasion of Ukraine has been a strategic calamity. It has weakened Russia, strengthened its geopolitical rivals, and no matter how the war ends from here, it's hard to see how that changes. And so today, rather than talking about a particular system, about tanks, about aircraft, or a particular battle, I want to zoom out and look at this war at a grand strategic level. I want to examine what the Russians were trying to achieve, and how all of those objectives have been undone one by one. And in doing so, I want to establish the fact that while some degree of Russian strategic defeat now seems inevitable, the results for Ukraine are not baked in. Russian strategic defeat doesn't necessarily have to mean a Ukrainian strategic victory. The fight for a powerful, restored Russian empire has probably already been lost. But the fight for a free, independent and prosperous Ukraine, that very much goes on. So in trying to break up this rather ambitious topic, I'm going to try and do a couple of things. First, I'm going to look at Russia's history of empire, whether it be the Russian Empire or the Soviet Union. I want to give some context as to how those states became so powerful, but also the kind of mistakes that led to their ending. It's history that I think is valuable to put some context around Putin's decision making in Ukraine. Then I'm going to try and define Russia's strategic objectives and doctrine approaching the Ukraine war. Not based on foreign or Western logic, but what on Russian sources have said about what they are trying to achieve. Having established what I think Russia's stated goals were, I'll then go on to show how they spectacularly sabotaged all of them over the course of their invasion in Ukraine. I'll even try to demonstrate that even if Russia wins a battlefield victory and achieves all of its stated war goals from this point on, it will still find itself in a far worse position than it was when the war began. Finally, I'll close out by looking at the war to come and what it means for Ukraine's strategic objectives. Because there, I would argue, unlike with Russia, the story very much remains to be written. And as is so often the case, we're going to start with a little bit of history because it's impossible to separate Russian grand strategic thinking and doctrine from Russia's long history as a great power. Almost every day on Russian state media, you'll see the same idea expressed a hundred different ways that Russia isn't an ordinary country. Russia is a great power. Russia is singular. Russia is an empire. Russia is an inheritor to a legacy that goes back to the Soviet Union and the glorious Russian Empire. And that as a result, Russia has a right, or indeed an obligation and a duty, to exert power in its surrounding territories. Questions around Eastern Europe, the Baltic States, or Central Asia are always phrased in terms of Russia's security or other legitimate interests, never in terms of the rights those nations enjoy to be free and independent. Moscow's voice, it is implied, is by far the most important, and that when Russia speaks, other countries on the global stage should listen. And if you look at both history and geography, you can see how that idea might have developed. There are a lot of things that go into determining whether particular nations evolve into great powers. Russia has enjoyed historically the benefits of many of them. Resources, population and territory are all inputs into a nation's strategic influence. And if you go back to the Russian Empire in particular, the nation had all three in spades. In 1897, at a time when the United States was well short of 76 million inhabitants, the Russian Empire was home to 125.6 million people and rapidly growing. The Russian Empire commanded a truly massive amount of territory, and within that territory were bountiful natural resources, many of which would not be discovered until well after the Empire fell. And the list of things that the Russians had going for them really could go on. 
For example, they had religious influence over much of the Orthodox world. They had cultural connections to Slavic populations across Europe. If real life were a video game, the Russian starting position would definitely be easy mode. But as history has shown, just because a nation has access to immense resources doesn't mean it's destined to succeed. History are full of empires who fell despite their nominal strength. In China, they still refer to the hundred years of national humiliation that began with the First Opium War in 1839. China was the most populous nation on the planet. It had a rich culture and a long history. But that didn't stop the country being repeatedly defeated and humiliated by foreign powers. A huge array of factors can go into whether empires rise or fall. Natural disasters like famine or floods can play their part. But so too can the decisions of governments and individuals. Poor leadership can doom an empire to internal collapse and failure. Or vice versa, if a neighbouring power happens to have a particularly talented leader, you might be in trouble. If Alexander the Great starts next door and you're a neighbour, well, that might be the end of your long and storied history. And while the quality of Russian leadership over the centuries has varied from the extremely competent to the totally inept, some key strategic errors seem to repeat themselves. The failure to reform civil and political society to combat influences like corruption, the prioritisation of resources for military development rather than the improvement of people's living standards, the tendency to try and dominate and dictate to surrounding nations and peoples rather than leading them, and finally, some series of actions born of overconfidence in which the empire or the government overreaches, ultimately leading to the system's collapse. This is a grossly simplified picture of centuries of development and history. But in terms of understanding what's happened in Ukraine, I think there's a relevant pattern. To illustrate the point, let's quickly jump back to the Russian Empire itself of the pre-World War I era. Despite having collapsed more than a century ago, you don't have to look particularly far to see Russian imperial symbols in Russia today. The imperial double-headed eagle remains Russia's state coat of arms. And if you follow Russian right-wing commentators on Telegram, you'll often see them refer to Russia's old imperial borders or its old imperial power. Strangely enough, often the same groups that practice Soviet nostalgia will also practice imperial nostalgia, despite the fact that, you know, the Soviets killed the Tsar. The important part is probably not ideology, but rather simply the memory of a time that Russia was strong. And the Russian Empire wasn't just strong, it was a rapidly growing and developing power. It's often pointed out that the Russian Empire pre-World War I was horribly behind Western Europe in terms of its rate of industrialization or literacy or life expectancy. And all of those things are true. But what's also true is that Russia's industry was growing at a dizzying pace, as was its population. German strategic thinking before World War I often alluded to the fact that it would be better if there was a war sooner rather than later. Because in the medium to long term, Russia's continued industrial development and military modernization meant that the country would face a greater and greater threat until it might be beyond Germany's ability to contain. On paper, the empire was backwards, that it had everything it need to turn itself into a dominant power. But as with so many other great empires in history, Russia was its own worst enemy. Efforts to reform the government or fight corruption were anemic. For large parts of Russian history, some civil servants weren't even paid a salary because it was expected that they would make their money through bribes. In terms of resource prioritization, resources were poured into the military and into other state projects. But efforts to raise the living standards of the population didn't exactly proceed apace. And that set the stage for the kind of popular discontent that would eventually lead to revolution. And then there was the manner in which Russia interacted with the various people within the empire who were not themselves ethnic Russians. And in that respect, the Russian empire, particularly towards the end of the 1800s, embraced a policy of Russification. The idea that what all the people of the empire really wanted was to be Russians. It became state policy to do things like push orthodoxy and the Russian language into Poland at the expense of Catholicism and Polish. I'll leave it to the audience to imagine how well that one was received. And while Poland had historically been prone to rebellion, Finland was a different story. It's hard to imagine today where we all think of Finland as a proud independent nation, but for some parts of the Russian Empire's history, the Finns were regarded to be relatively loyal members of the Russian Empire. The country enjoyed considerable legal and linguistic autonomy. And during the reign of Tsar Alexander II in the mid-1800s, development was quick and things were relatively peaceful. There's still actually a statue of Alexander II in Helsinki. But in the later years of the Russian Empire, all of that would be changed. 
Finland's legal autonomy would be swept away, Russian law would prevail, the Russian language would be promoted at the expense of Finnish, and conscription was expanded. The Finns referred to this as the years of oppression. And far from turning the Finns into loyal Russians, it turned loyal Russian subjects into separatists. The rest, as they say, is history. Defeat in the Russo-Japanese War and in World War I would be the stress points that caused the Russian Empire to fracture. When it did, the peoples of countries like Finland and Poland would immediately seize their opportunities at independence. The civil war that followed would be a demographic and industrial disaster for the former Russian Empire. Millions died in the war and subsequent repressions before Soviet power was finally re-established. But eventually, painfully re-established it was. The Soviet Union would expand to absorb most of the territories of the former Russian Empire. And of all the republics that made up the Soviet Union, Russia was by far the most populous and most influential. For all the damage caused by the Russian Civil War, Stalin's policies and the Second World War, the Soviet Union entered the 1950s and 60s as an undisputed major power. In 1960, the Soviet Union had a population of 214 million at a time where the United States only had 179. And even as late as 1989, it was the second largest economy in the world. While we often associate the Soviet Union with the economic and technological stagnation of its final years, through some of the early and mid-Cold War, the Soviet Union was actually growing faster than many countries in the West. To the point where you can still find some intelligence assessments from the era suggesting the Soviet Union would eventually overtake the United States in economic output. After all, the USSR had a large industrial base, now a larger pool of exploitable raw materials and natural resources, particularly oil and hydrocarbons, and a large network of satellite states in Eastern Europe. But some of the very same themes and decisions that had undermined the Russian Empire would later come back to haunt the Soviet Union as well. Corruption and a crushing bureaucracy had a caustic, stagnating, decaying impact on the country and the economy over time. Falsified reports, stealing from one's workplace, all of these little acts of petty and organisational corruption just became the done thing. The country poured immense resources into military heavy industry, building tanks and armoured vehicles by the tens of thousands, building one of the largest armed forces the world had ever seen, all to keep up with the threat ostensibly posed by the Americans and NATO. But whereas the United States economy could afford the arms build-up, the Soviet Union arguably couldn't, and the Union fell behind in other key areas, like consumer goods. There were plenty of tanks, jets and armoured vehicles, but the quality and quantity of available consumer goods, washing machines, sausages, cheese, clothes, things for people to spend their hard-earned money on, those were either in short supply or of low quality. Then there were acts of massive strategic overreach, like the war in Afghanistan. And again, just as in the Russian Empire, there was also the question of how the Soviet Union dealt with its satellite states or subject populations. Broadly speaking, there are two key ways to hold an alliance or an empire together, by mutual consent, or by coercive force. The Soviet Union tried both strategies, but often relied on the latter. Whether it was Hungary in 1956, or the Czechs and the Slovaks in 1968, the Soviet Union made it very clear to all involved that if you wanted to leave, well, that was just too bad. And rolling in the tanks in response to dissent didn't exactly win much goodwill. I mean, I don't want to be accused of being too glib here. But generally speaking, political systems that are doing a good job of winning their people over don't have to build walls and barbed wire in order to keep their people in. The combination of repression and economic stagnation meant that for ordinary people, there often wasn't much appeal either to the Soviet Union or to the Warsaw Pact. And so the moment most people and countries were finally given a choice as to whether they wanted to be part of the Soviet or communist project or not, well, they voted not. Gorbachev is often blamed for bringing down the Soviet Union by giving out freedoms that destabilise the fragile Soviet system. There may be some truth to that, but I have to ask the question, would those freedoms have been so dangerous if everyone didn't already want to leave? I've often heard American and other English-speaking apologists for Russia talk about Ukraine and describe the fact that there are parts of Ukraine which are naturally part of Russia, that Russia's territorial ambitions are understandable. But what I think that analysis misses is what the numbers say. In 1991, when Ukrainians were given a choice to vote for independence from the USSR, 92.3% of Ukrainians voted yes. Majorities were achieved in every single oblast, 
including notably both Crimea and the Donbass. Whether it was the Baltic states or Ukraine or the Central Asian countries, the moment the people of these areas were given a choice of freedom and independence, they took it with both hands. Those same old mistakes had felled yet another empire. But Russia hadn't run out of chances yet. The 1990s were a time of chaos, but they also began as an era of promise. Make no mistake, Russia in 1990 had suffered immensely from the breakup of the Soviet Union, but a majority of the population supported independence and they supported Yeltsin. The nation was inevitably going to suffer a painful adjustment as it moved away from its status within the Soviet Union to being an independent country, but it still had so much going for it. It still had a strong industrial and resource base. It still had oil and natural gas. It still had an educated, capable workforce. And in that moment, there was also a wave of optimism in the West that opened Russia up to the world. But in Slavic history, moments of hope must be immediately followed by crushing disappointment and despair. Corruption at the highest levels of power destroyed the Russian economy and robbed the Russian people of their inheritance. The process of privatization was so corrupted and mismanaged that it essentially transported the collective wealth in terms of resources and industry of the old Soviet Union and concentrated it in the hands of a number of oligarchs. A very few became incredibly, fabulously wealthy almost overnight. Whereas for most Russians, well, the story was of extensive inflation and extreme unemployment. Life expectancy, social outcomes, all of these indicators fell through the floor, as once again, a failure to control corruption or put the people first led to horrible consequences for Russia's regular people. As for the development of Russian democracy, it's usually not considered a good sign for a country's democratic institutions when army tanks start firing shells at the parliamentary building, which is exactly what happened in 1993. I won't dwell too much on this era, but suffice to say the Putin era followed, leading us slightly closer to the present day. I cover all of that history for a very important reason, to show the power and influence that Russia has lost. The Russian Empire and Soviet Union both enjoyed privileged positions of influence on the global stage. And I think it's very hard to understand Russian grand strategy and doctrine without understanding the desire to reclaim at least some of that legacy. Because perhaps one of the biggest mistakes that an analyst can make when regarding a foreign power or a foreign decision maker is to assume that they think and value things exactly the same way that you do. If we're going to judge whether the Russian invasion of Ukraine was a strategic success or failure, we shouldn't judge it through the lens of what we might be trying to achieve in their position, but rather what they are trying to achieve. For example, Putin's government historically clearly hasn't been trying to maximise Russian living standards or economic growth. It has put aside hundreds of billions of dollars in foreign exchange reserves. It's invested extremely heavily in the military industrial complex, rather than diverting those resources into productive infrastructure or services for the Russian people. That suggests a different set of strategic goals, and we should look closer to try and determine what they are. And when many people think of Russian grand strategy, they're quick to point to the works of Alexander Dugin. Now, Alexander Dugin is an interesting character. He looks a little bit like Rasputin. After the fall of the Soviet Union, he helped found something called the National Bolshevik Party, which basically tried to combine ultra-nationalist ideas with Bolshevism. He would go on to write a number of influential books, including The Foundations of Geopolitics. As an aside, his daughter Daria was basically in the same business until she was killed in a car bombing in Moscow in August of 2022. Now, the foundation of geopolitics is taught at Russian staff colleges, and it's basically a how-to book for how Russia should, if not conquer the world, at the very least dominate Eurasia. It includes the suggestion that Russia should make some minor adjustments to the international order in order to undermine American influence. In particular, things like Ukraine should be annexed as the state, Dugan contends, has no geopolitical meaning, cultural import, or ethnic exclusiveness. Geez, where else have I heard that argument lately? But at the very least, the Ukrainians would be kept in good company because they also wanted to annex Belarus, Moldova, and Finland, parts of Georgia, and the Caucasus, as well as Mongolia. Parts of the world that weren't to be annexed should at the very least, in many cases, be influenced by Russia, and because, interestingly enough, because it was a threat hypothetically to Russia, the book also originally called for China to be dismembered and broken down into constituent states. 
Now, if that basically sounds like a batshit crazy instruction manual for borderline global conquest, you wouldn't be wrong. But while the title might be influential, it's important to note that Dugan's never been in the Russian government. His ideas aren't official policy. And so it would be unfair to read Russian government actions solely through the lens of his writings. Instead, I'd suggest looking at something a little bit more official, the writings and thinking of the former foreign minister of the Russian Federation, Evgeny Primakov. He has featured in Russian official media, and back in 2014, Lavrov predicted that historians might coin a new term, the Primakov Doctrine. This was a set of principles and objectives that the former foreign minister had advanced as ideas to help guide Russian strategic decision-making. So when looking at an indicator of what the Russian government is thinking, I'm going to go with the former foreign minister as opposed to the Rasputin cosplayer. The doctrine has been expressed a few different ways by Western observers, but a few key principles do hold true. The first principle is that Russia must seek to undermine US power and influence. There can be no unipolar world dominated by the United States. The second is that Russia must have primacy in the post-Soviet space and lead integration in that region. Now, that obviously instantly means that states that used to be part of the Soviet Union, like the Baltic states or Ukraine, are off limits for Western influence. And if Russia can extend its control over those nations in the former Warsaw Pact as well, well then, all the better. And given that objective, it naturally extends to the idea that NATO expansion is to be resisted and avoided. If you think about it for more than two seconds, it really is a logical extension. It is much harder for Russia to exercise influence and control over a country if it's under the NATO security guarantee or if it's economically integrated into the European Union. On their own, many former Soviet states would be no match for Russia. There would be immense economic, political, and potentially military pressure for them to fall in line. But if you go and let countries like Estonia join NATO, well, then they might get big ideas about being independent from Russian influence. And that, most figures in the Russian government would suggest, is directly contrary to Russia's strategic interests. Now, I have heard the argument before that Russian doctrine and strategic thinking is essentially defensive in nature, here is how the argument goes. Russia has been invaded multiple times throughout its history. Its borders aren't very defensible because they're mostly flat and open. The country was traumatized by invasions by people like Napoleon and Hitler, and as a result, Russia seeks to expand its influence to create a geographical buffer zone. In order to defend itself, it wants to put other countries, like buffer states of the former Warsaw Pact, in the way of a potential invader, or to expand up to defensible choke points like mountain ranges rather than its open steppe plains. Some will then argue that Russia obviously enjoys the right to security, and as a result, these are legitimate defensive security interests. Personally, I would like to humbly suggest that that argument is bullshit. For one, no country on Earth is entitled to defensible frontiers. Just ask the Poles, or the Ukrainians, or any citizen of any country in Africa whose borders were essentially drawn as a straight line by a former colonial power. And giving Russia defensible frontiers would mean Russia ruling over or influencing a huge foreign population. Those countries, like Poland and Ukraine, also themselves enjoy a right to self-defense and sovereignty. And there's no principled reason that their right to exist should be sacrificed in order to make Russians feel a little bit safer. Especially since, I would argue, Russia was one of the least likely countries on planet Earth to be invaded by a foreign power. The Russians will often argue that there was a threat that NATO would attack Russia. My question, essentially, is how on Earth would that force ever be collectively mobilized and convinced that, guys, it is time to invade Russia? And here's the kicker even if it did decide to invade Russia, would having additional geographical boundaries really help? Because while having a buffer zone in the former Warsaw Pact or Soviet states might have made sense as a defensive strategy against Napoleon or in the Second World War, nuclear weapons now exist. If there is a war of annihilation against Russia, it will be a nuclear conflict, either because the attacker deploys the weapons or because the Russians do. And I've always struggled to understand why a country with the world's largest declared stockpile of nuclear warheads feels itself at threat of a conventional invasion. Because if NATO tanks were rolling towards Moscow, I expect the Russian reaction would be to deploy tactical nuclear weapons against those tanks. And given that the invading force isn't, you know, fighting on the Russian border but is instead miles from Moscow, you expect that most of the neutral powers of the world would look at that nuclear employment and go, yeah, fair play. 
This is the reason that former Russian Defence Minister Igor Sergeyev put forward the idea that resources should first be diverted towards Russia's nuclear deterrent. Because even if Russia was outmatched in conventional arms by the NATO alliance, the nuclear weapons could keep the Russian homeland safe. So to me, any Russian doctrinal objective to annex or dominate surrounding countries is the result of something other than a legitimate defensive strategic interest. It's not something that can be legitimately called self-defense. NATO expansion was a threat to Russian influence, not to Russian survival. But whatever the moral worth of those goals, let's take them as a given for helping to inform Russian strategy. They want to dominate the post-Soviet space. As an extension of that, they want to weaken NATO influence and halt its expansion. They want to weaken American dominance and the unipolar world order. And they want to improve the strategic balance to better favor Russia. There are also strategic goals that they have enumerated in relation to Ukraine, but we'll get to those in just a moment. So now that we have some idea of what Russian strategic objectives and doctrine might be, let's have a look at some of how Russian policy leading up to the war in Ukraine advanced or weakened those objectives. Because I've often heard it argued that the war in Ukraine was inevitable, and I'm really not sure if I agree. Because if we go back pre-2014, relations between Russia and the rest of Europe and relations with Ukraine are actually pretty good. I remember watching the Victory Day Parade in 2010, and you've got an image there of Ukrainian troops marching in the celebration. And you might go, hey, yeah, sure, that's a little ironic given current events, but not particularly surprising. All right, well, here's a picture of the Poles marching on Red Square as well, and they were joined by the French, the Americans, and the British. I didn't see any Australians or Canadians in the lineup, but I'm guessing the Poms were flying the flag for all of us. I want you to look at that image of Polish troops being invited to march down Red Square, and then remember that that was less than 15 years ago. Something very clearly changed. Because if Polish troops found themselves on Red Square right now, I have a feeling they'd be going straight for the Kremlin. Events in Ukraine clearly helped galvanize this change. In 2014, a revolution overthrew the pro-Russian president of Ukraine at the time, Yanukovych, after he pulled out of signing an incredibly popular association agreement with the European Union against the wishes of, well, most of the population. I don't want to go too much into the details of the 2014 revolution just because there's an awful lot of propaganda around it and it would take up an entire video. I'm just going to focus on Russian decision making in relation to that revolution. Because I'd argue Putin didn't exactly play his best 4D chess during that exchange. Firstly, it's reported that the Kremlin pushed Yanukovych to pull out from the association agreement, which helped spark the entire revolution. I'd argue that was clearly mistake number one. Mistake number two was when Yanukovych was allowed or encouraged to flee. It's hard for a president to claim they maintain their legitimate authority when they flee their country for a foreign nation. The third was how Russia chose to respond to the revolution. On the two extremes, for example, Russia could have tried to work openly with the new government, re-establish its soft power and influence, and steadily regain influence and popularity in Ukraine. On the other end of the spectrum, it's entirely possible in 2014 that Russia could have maybe under the justification of an invitation from Yanukovych to help restore order, sent the Russian army into Ukraine to occupy the country. The Ukrainian military was in such a dire state, and some of it would still have been pro-Yanukovych, that it's hard to imagine the Russian military wouldn't have been able to achieve significant success. Instead, Putin opted for a less risky middle option. Russian troops moved into and annexed Crimea. Domestically, the annexation of Crimea was a massive victory for Putin's government and his popularity. And just as he had likely calculated, the response by Western countries to that annexation were incredibly anemic. But you can argue there were deep strategic costs associated with the move that weren't obvious at the time. For one, it changed the political calculus in Ukraine itself. A lot of the pro-Russian individuals within Ukraine lived in Crimea, and they were no longer voting in Ukrainian elections, now they were going to vote in Russian ones. It was going to become harder for Ukrainian politicians to take openly pro-Russian stances because now Russia was occupying sovereign Ukrainian territory. And whereas NATO involvement in Ukraine was practically zero before 2014, all future training and security assistance activities would ultimately grow out of the occupation of Crimea and Russian activity in the Donbass. By openly deploying its hard power against the people of Ukraine, it sacrificed a lot of the soft power and influence it had over the country, and then acted all surprised when Ukraine continued to drift towards the West. Here's a tip that you can all apply in your own lives. If you want to make friends with your neighbours, 
don't knock down the fence and declare that you're annexing their backyard. And what made it all the worse is that Putin had previously gone in front of the media and declared that there was no territorial dispute over Crimea and that he fully respected Ukraine's territorial integrity. But I'd argue even the annexation of Crimea probably wasn't enough to guarantee the strategic disaster that we now see. Russia had lost influence, but it had gained territory, and war wasn't yet inevitable. In January of 2022, I'd in fact argue that Russia was in a pretty good position strategically. Russian economic relevance in Europe was very real. Nord Stream 2 was going to come online, which would only increase Russian economic influence over Germany. The Russian military was greatly feared. There were a lot of articles coming out in think tanks basically saying that Russia could take Ukraine if they wanted. Meanwhile, in Ukraine itself, the Zelensky government was incredibly unpopular, as was the ongoing grinding war in the Donbass. Russian information campaigns in Europe and the United States were bearing fruit. And as we'll see later, positive opinions of Russia in many particularly right-wing parties in Europe were quite high. And as for the chances of Ukraine joining NATO at any point in the near future, well, those sat between zero and none. Countries can't join NATO while they have active territorial disputes, and Ukraine had two, the Donbass and Crimea. And even if an attempt had been made to bring Ukraine into NATO despite those territorial disputes, can you ever imagine someone like Viktor Orban signing off on Ukrainian membership under those circumstances? So Ukraine was not about to join NATO, its government was unpopular and potentially unstable, the Russian economy was projected to grow rapidly and its military was continuing to modernise. And while it's hard to speak with absolute confidence over hypotheticals, can you imagine if Russia had not invaded after America had screamed at the top of its lungs that it was going to do so? The Americans would have been made to look like a bunch of alarmists desperately out to mobilise the world against Russia that wasn't actually being aggressive. It would have gone further to weakening NATO unity that was already arguably at something of a historical low ebb. If you're looking for a clear and present danger to Russian security, you'll have to help me out here because I can't see one. Putin could have waited it out, continued to play the information game, made the Americans look like a bunch of alarmists, and try to rebuild influence in Ukraine over time. Instead, it was time for the good old classic mistake number four, overextension and overreach. Convinced that the Western powers would do nothing, convinced that the Ukrainian government would fold, convinced that his military was one of the greatest in the world and capable of doing the job that he had set before it, Putin sent in the tanks. Which brings us finally to the question of how did the invasion play out and was it a strategic success? I know you've probably figured out my answer by now, but hear me out anyway. The answer, of course, is it was a complete bloody train wreck. The Russian army first bogged down and then lost much of the territory it had taken to Ukraine over the course of 2022. Visually confirmed losses were mind-bendingly heavy, and they were driven by some of those same old mistakes we discussed earlier. A failure to reform government and society meant that once again, corruption and lies came into play. Corruption had weakened the Russian military and a culture of deception and lies, meant that Putin had an unrealistic image of how Ukraine would respond and how capable his own forces were. Meanwhile, Russian rhetoric and attitudes helped drive Ukrainian resistance. There was a lot of feeling of brotherhood at one point between Ukrainians and Russians. But Putin's rhetoric denied Ukrainian nationality. It denied Ukraine's historical existence. It denied its culture. It essentially cast Ukraine not in the role of a brotherly nation, but essentially as misguided mini-Russians. And that approach went down about as well as Russification of Poland or Finland did in the far past. Finally, just about every aspect of the invasion, the idea that a country the size of Ukraine could be invaded by the Russian military, under strength, pre-mobilization, and somehow take the city of Kyiv while also attacking in the Donbass, the northeast and the south, all at the same time, well, it was the very definition of overextension and overreach. The Russian military had been given a task that was beyond its resources and it was about to be punished for it. But in the early months of the war, it still wasn't clear that Russia had done irreparable strategic damage to its own interests. I argued, I think two months into the war, that Russia still had the possibility to get out of this without disaster. Because Russia's objectives in Ukraine had been so vaguely defined, Putin had said they were there to demilitarize Ukraine and to counter nationalist elements, well, those goals were so vague that they could basically achieve nothing, go home, and the Russian media could probably somehow spin it as a victory. 
That wouldn't be ideal. It would still be far more damaging than never having invaded at all, but it was still possible. It was still on the table. So after several months of defeat and hard fighting, when European powers are talking about the desire to give Putin an off-ramp, Putin looked at this completely viable off-ramp, wherein he could withdraw but still claim victory, rigged that off-ramp with explosives, and blew it up. The moment I'm talking about, of course, is when Putin decided to declare that he was annexing the regions of Donetsk, Luhansk, Zaporizhia, and Kherson. Now, some might have been shocked by this announcement, because when Russia had invaded Ukraine in February, Putin had been very clear about the fact that they were not there to grab territory. A few months later, they were announcing the annexation of territories larger than many European countries. But the annexation was more than just an act of political bravado. In annexing these territories, Putin had done something most politicians will fight to the death to avoid. They had given people a measurable, objective mechanism to judge whether they were a success or failure. The original public goals for the invasion, demilitarizing Ukraine and, quote, denazifying it, were extremely vague. Demilitarizing Ukraine could mean something as simple as destroying a couple of pieces of military equipment and going home. Given that Ukraine wasn't run by a Nazi or ultranationalist government, denazifying the country could mean literally anything, including achieving basically nothing. Arguably, simply withdrawing Wagner troops out of Ukraine would achieve the denazification objective because it would reduce the number of fascists on the territory of Ukraine. But annexing these territories now meant that any peace plan in which Russia didn't gain full control of these regions was now a strategic failure. And I think that it's at this point you can argue that Russian strategic defeat essentially became locked in. Of course, that's a pretty big claim to make, and whether or not you think Russia has suffered a strategic defeat depends a lot on what you think its strategic goals were. If the goal was to stimulate the Ukrainian scrap metal industry or provide a stimulus package for the US military industrial complex, then obviously the invasion has been a tremendous success. But it's probably fairer to assess success or failure through the lens of Russia's own strategic objectives. We talked about the Primakov Doctrine before and its objectives, so let's apply them here. The invasion should undermine US power, influence, and hegemony, it should advance Russian domination of the post-Soviet space, and it should weaken or resist NATO and NATO expansion. We'll also add to that the objectives that Putin himself put forward to the Russian public and to the world. Initially, this was the demilitarization of Ukraine and the removal of ultranationalist elements, followed a couple of months later by a declaration that this totally not a land grab war was in fact for the purpose of seizing control of four regions of Ukraine. And so it's those goals, the goals of the Primakov Doctrine and the ones that Putin put forward to the public and the world, that I want to judge the Russian invasion against. Because no matter which one you look at, the answer isn't pretty. Now, in making that statement, I want to be clear about one thing. I don't know how this war is going to end. At time of recording, Russia is still attacking on multiple fronts and has significant military resources. Western support is uncertain, but also critical determining how far Ukraine is able to go in the future and how this war plays out. But my point essentially is that from the Russian strategic perspective, it almost doesn't matter. In order to prove that point, let's embark on a little bit of a thought experiment. And with great apologies to my listeners from Ukraine, let's imagine for a moment that Russia wins that Russia achieves everything that it says it has set out to achieve. Uh, in 2024, Tucker Carlson is elected President of the United States, Western support for Ukraine drops away, and after a grinding military campaign, eventually Russia is able to take full control of Luhansk, Donetsk, Zaporizhia, and Kherson. Without Western support and pressured by the Russian military, Ukraine signs a treaty which commits it to never joining NATO and becoming a neutral, in inverted commas, state. Somehow, Russia convinces countries around the world to recognize the annexation of these additional regions, which is something not even most Russian allies have done, but let, let's hand wave it away and assume that everyone from France to the People's Republic of China recognizes Kherson as part of the Russian Federation. In this dream scenario, how has Russia gone against its core strategic objectives? To deal first with the idea of halting NATO expansion and weakening the NATO alliance. And in this respect, I'd argue the Russian campaign has already been a colossal failure. If Jens Stoltenberg could get away with giving Putin a medal for being NATO recruiter of the year, I think he'd bloody well do it. It just brings home the point that if your goal is to try and break up a security alliance in Europe, the worst bloody way to go about it is by starting a conventional war in Europe and making everyone really nervous. As a result of the war in Ukraine, three things are happening to NATO. 
It's enlarging with the applications of Sweden and Finland. It's remilitarizing in the sense that all of its member states are now pouring resources steadily into rebuilding their armed forces. I mean, I have seen the argument that Russia is somehow demilitarizing NATO by destroying its equipment in Ukraine, but that doesn't pass the pub test. NATO countries are gearing up to produce replacement equipment at record levels and at levels the Russian economy, given its size, simply can't match long term. And even if that weren't the case, the idea of demilitarizing your opponent by face tanking their ammunition reserves with your infantry and armored vehicles isn't exactly a 4D chess move. And another thing the Russian invasion has done is given NATO a renewed sense of purpose and a surge in public popularity. NATO scepticism was a real phenomenon, both in the United States and in some countries in Europe. But for some reason, the sight of a non-NATO European country being attacked by the Russian Federation seems to have motivated everyone else to group up a little bit tighter and to build more guns. In terms of the net impact on the conventional military balance between NATO and Russia, I would argue that on this basis alone, even a Russian victory in Ukraine would be a strategic defeat. I mean, the newly elected president of the Czech Republic is literally a former general who used to be the chair of the NATO Military Commission. Geez, I wonder what his opinion on NATO and the threat from Russia will be. I'd also argue that closer ties between Ukraine and NATO are more likely now than they were before the invasion. I've already explained why Ukraine was never going to be able to join NATO in the near or medium term as long as it had territorial disputes with Russia. Ukrainian public opinion on NATO membership was also somewhat divided. Now a strong majority supports applying for NATO membership. Even in a dream Russian military win scenario, I can't imagine closer relations between Ukraine and NATO being entirely prevented. War and the threat of war is a pretty strong motivator. And then there's the goal of undermining American influence, and it's this one that I find particularly ironic. One theme that I've noticed in commentary that excuses Russian operations in Ukraine is their comments and views don't tend to recognize Ukraine as an independent sovereign actor. They only view Ukraine as an extension of the United States. It's almost as if Russia isn't attacking Ukraine, it's attacking the US and US influence. Now that view is obviously wrong. The people of Ukraine are independent human beings with their own decision-making faculties. They have a right to self-determination and sovereignty. But even if you buy into all of that logic, the conflict has actually boosted US influence rather than undermined it. Europe's transition away from energy dependence on Russia has pushed it towards an energy dependence on Europe. Where do you think a lot of the LNG that is now powering the continent is coming from? It's coming from the United States and it's coming from Qatar. Then there's been the massive boon to the US arms industry, which is going to be one of the main beneficiaries of countries around the world who now perceive a security threat buying up capabilities as rapidly as possible. A lot of the spending that European countries and countries around the world will now do will be directed towards American arms imports. And the damage to Russian arms exports opens up opportunities for American exporters in countries that used to be sewn up by the Russian market. Countries like India are definitely in the crosshairs. And then there's just the focus on security alliances in general. The sight of a modern conventional war in Europe has made a lot of countries very nervous. It's put a lot more focus on the idea of preserving their security. That's benefited American interests in two key ways. Firstly, when countries need a security partner, the Americans are the obvious partner. If you're ever in trouble and you need someone to come off the sideline and hit him with the chair, it's Uncle Sam. And so popular and bilateral relations between various countries in the United States have only improved as a result of the invasion. And European rearmament in response to the Russian invasion is also a gigantic boon to the United States itself. The US has long wanted Europe to take security more seriously, to spend more on its own defense so that the United States can rebalance its efforts towards the Asia Pacific. Thanks to Vladimir Putin's actions, that's basically exactly what has happened. In the near term, more American forces have had to forward deploy to Europe. But in the medium to long term, there'll be a lot more capable European formations with more modern equipment capable of doing that job. Americans, if you have a medal for foreigners who contribute to the interests and security of the United States in a serious and material way, I'd seriously consider nominating Vladimir Vladimirovich. It even seems like Putin succeeded in making American hegemony and global leadership a more popular concept globally. The two polls on the screen here compare votes in 2018 to 2022, on whether or not the residents of a country would prefer a world led by the US or China. 
But whether you put the other power as China or Russia, the theme across the various polls I've looked at remains the same. Compared to four years ago, more people would prefer the US to be the major leading global power than any alternative. It's impossible to isolate just how much of that effect is due to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I'll look at some other stats a bit later on that might give us a little bit of a clue, however. But the point is, over the last few years, even though people in countries might continue to complain about American leadership, most people in most countries seem to prefer it to any alternative. So congratulations, Americans, you are the least worst option. And American influence is even moving its way into the post-Soviet space in Central Asia and the Caucasus. Remember that expanding Russian influence over the post-Soviet space is a strategic objective in and of itself. Well, here's a photo of Nancy Pelosi landing in Armenia. Good job, Vlad. With the Russian economy weakening and most of the Russian army tied up in Ukraine, Russia's ability to project influence elsewhere has been significantly weakened. That creates an opening, an opening that countries like the United States or the People's Republic of China can move into. In trying to win influence in Ukraine, Russia may have lost a significant amount of pull elsewhere. Then there's one of the objectives that Putin put forward himself, protecting the people of the Donbass. All right, so let's just take this one literally and at face value. You may also have heard this argument as one in which Ukraine was shelling the Donbass relentlessly for years and Russia had to intervene. Okay, so let's look at the UN report here. In 2020, eight civilians in the Donbass were killed on both sides of the dividing line by active hostilities. A further 17 were killed by mines and unexploded ordnance and one by other causes, leaving a total of 26 civilians killed. In 2021, the figure of civilians killed by active hostilities, so shelling, was seven and a further 12 were killed by mines and unexploded ordnance, for a total of 25. So the relentless shelling that is alleged was killing approximately one civilian every two months. That's obviously still a very real tragedy, but if death rates like that justify an invasion, I expect to see Russian paratroops in Chicago any day now. So in order to save the population of the Donbass from suffering seven civilian casualties from shelling and active hostilities per year, Russia of course launches its invasion, and if we look at the official statistics of the so-called Donetsk People's Republic, only covering their territory, not Luhansk, not the Ukrainian-controlled territories, and only what they will admit, over the course of 2022, 4,176 military personnel and 1,089 civilians were killed, directly as a result of military activities. Other sources suggest that the military casualties should in fact be far higher. But looking just at civilians, because that's who Vladimir Putin was presumably trying to protect, by invading, he has increased casualties in the Donetsk People's Republic, assuming all of those seven killed in 2021 were in Donetsk, which isn't true. He has increased the casualty rate for civilians by 155 times. Many of the settlements in the Donbass are now ruins. That photo there is from April last year, I believe of a town called Novotoshkivka. It looks like something out of The Walking Dead, frankly, and I'm sure whatever residents remain are feeling well and truly protected and liberated. The Donbass has suffered from shelling, bombing, and the DNR and LNR also from extensive conscription. We've talked before about how much of the male population was used as essentially disposable mobilized personnel long before Russia declared its own mobilization. While we'll only get exact details after the end of the war, I hate to imagine how many years it will take for this region to recover, if it ever does. And then there's the goal of demilitarizing Ukraine and repressing what the Russians call Ukrainian nationalism or quote, Nazism. Understanding this idea probably requires a deeper dive into Russian ideology and thinking than I have time for here. But suffice to say to some Russian ideologues, the very idea of Ukrainian nationalism, the idea of Ukraine as an independent culture, language, tradition, and state is threatening to the idea of the greater Russian world. In an ideal world, Russia probably wants a government in Kyiv which is friendly to Russia and which views Ukraine as secondary and subservient to Russia. But since Russia has explicitly said that regime change is not one of their objectives, I'm going to assume that even in a Russian victory scenario, they don't make it to Kyiv and they don't install a pro-Russian government. And even if they did, it would probably be overthrown relatively quickly. Because there is no event of the past century that has done more, I would argue, to cement the popularity, the idea of a Ukrainian national identity, than the Russian invasion. To say that the opinion the Ukrainian public has of Russia has changed would be an understatement. Many have seen friends die, many have fought, 
Many have suffered, many have had the lights or the heating go off because of Russian bombardment. Many have friends, families and loved ones that will never come home. And based on historical precedent, it's unlikely those people will ever forgive Russia for what it's done. We're talking about a country in which people who used to speak Russian as their first language now often try to struggle through with Ukrainian instead, as some form of personal political statement. Even if you get Ukraine to sign some agreement saying that it's going to be a quote, neutral state, you don't get to legislate people's opinions. You don't get to change minds with treaties. And so I'd suggest there's a genuine chance that even in a Russian victory scenario, what they face is a revanchist Ukrainian population for years or decades to come. Governments that try and rally the population around reclaiming lost territories. Resistance movements that continue to wage war in those areas to make Russian occupation untenable. And a political environment where there is no doubt anymore that Ukraine's loyalties lie in the West, not towards Moscow. Putin hasn't destroyed Ukrainian patriotism and Ukrainian nationalism. He's entrenched it in a way that no other human being on this planet had the power to do. And some of that threat in terms of changing opinions and attitudes we're already seeing bear fruit. Ukraine isn't waiting for the end of this war to become more economically, politically, socially integrated with Europe. That process is happening right now. The Ukrainian power grid is now synced up with the European one. The number of train lines and physical connections between Poland and Ukraine have been expanded over the course of the war. Agreements on reduced friction in trade and customs are taking place, bringing Ukraine into closer and closer alignment with the European Union. And then, of course, there is the matter of human movements and influence. Millions of Ukrainians currently reside in the European Union. They have a voice. They've found a temporary home during this horrible crisis. And overall, Europe has been happy to take them. Connections aren't just forged between nations, they're forged between populations, they're forged between people. And that process doesn't get reversed just because Russian troops take another basement or apartment building on the outskirts of Bakhmut. And for all this, what does Russia get in return? What is it taking to counterbalance the changes in the overall strategic environment? Often I've seen it argued that the economic value of the regions that they're trying to annex would be more than enough to pay for the cost and casualties of the war. After all, some of these regions do have abundant natural resources that could hypothetically be exploited. But there's immense problems with doing so. The first is just the scale of destruction and depopulation. A lot of the infrastructure has been ruined, the buildings destroyed, and a lot of the people have left because they don't want to be part of this Russian world. Often those that remain are going to be those who don't feel they have anywhere else to go, which tends to be the older people. Your average Slavic pensioner is pretty formidable, but they're not the basis of a functional economy. And then there's a million other issues as well. Who is going to pay for the reconstruction of these regions? How will you attract foreign investors now that Russia is a pariah state? If you do extract energy resources like gas, for example, who are you going to sell it to? Certainly not the European Union. And how are you going to safely develop these resources when you have to assume there's going to be some sort of war of resistance or hybrid campaign from whatever Ukrainian state remains. Do you really want to build a gas refinery in occupied territory when every third Ukrainian knows how to drop a grenade from a drone? The reality is that no amount of conquered territory is going to compensate for the deep wounds that have been inflicted on the Russian economy. Russia's access to Western investment, Western technology, and Western human capital has likely been significantly reduced. Given the fact that so many investors in Russia lost their shirts after the invasion, I doubt they're going to be rushing to send capital back in. Then there's the loss of energy infrastructure and a valuable client. A lot of that pipeline infrastructure that cost billions of dollars and decades to build that was designed to transport energy to the European Union, that's basically now useless. And even if new infrastructure can be built to transport Russia's energy resources to, for example, China, if China is the only buyer, if there's no ability to encourage competition between Asia and Europe, well then China and Asian buyers are going to be in a position to dictate the price. Add to that massive losses in human capital from people fleeing the country, leaving because of mobilization or being killed or wounded by the war in Ukraine, and you have a relatively dark picture for the Russian economy. It's easy to focus on relatively small contraction numbers for the Russian economy, 2 or 3%, for example, doesn't sound like that much. But considering the Russian economy was expected to grow strongly every year for the next several years, it's actually a significant loss.
and the GDP figure doesn't adequately capture the loss of wealth and also the destruction of the stability of the Russian budget. The Russian budget has swung from surplus to deep deficit. And unless oil prices dramatically increase and stay elevated, it's hard to see how that will change. Especially if this war has to carry on for some time, and afterwards the Russian military has to be rebuilt. And rebuilt it'll have to be if Russia intends to use it as a vehicle for coercive power in foreign engagements, because the Ukrainians have done a pretty good job of wrecking a significant portion of it. A lot of Russia's best equipment and most modern tanks and armoured vehicles are already visually confirmed losses in Ukraine. But in some ways that's actually the less significant loss. Russia's endurance in this war so far has only been enabled by the tremendous amount of spare armour, artillery and ammunition that it had stockpiled before this conflict broke out. That was part of Russia's Soviet inheritance. Many of those stored vehicles dated back well into the era of the Soviet Union. The modern Russian economy couldn't produce thousands upon thousands of BMPs, and so that equipment, that staying power, has had to come from storage. As a trick, that only works once. Once the bunkers are empty and the storage fields are depleted, that's it. The ability of the Russian military to regenerate will be limited by the speed at which Russian military industry can produce new equipment and the degree to which the budget can afford to fund it. And given the disparity between the size of the Russian and European economies, that doesn't bode well for the overall security balance. And in terms of soft power and Russia's international opinion and influence, well, you can probably guess what the numbers say. Russia has historically put a lot of effort into influence operations, trying to win over members of the public, influence elections, or members of political parties. That's important because it's one of the mechanisms by which it breaks up opposing geopolitical blocks. And if you look at the statistics, you could argue that as recently as 2020, it was working. In some European countries, significant portions of the population had a positive view of the Russian Federation. 48% of Greeks, for example. 30% of the Germans, or 31% of the Spaniards. But after the invasion, that was all gone. Russia had tried to sell itself as a counterbalance to American influence. But now it just looked like a military aggressor and its approval ratings fell with it. The approval rating in Poland dropped to 2%. Support in Greece fell from 48 to 14%, and support in countries like Germany roughly halved. This doesn't mean 100% of the populations of these countries necessarily support sending an unlimited amount of weapons to Ukraine. But it does mean their support of and their favourable view towards Russia has almost completely evaporated. And the effect is particularly startling when you look at the polling of people who support some of Europe's more right-wing parties. Now, I don't define these parties as right-wing, it's survey data according to the Pew Research Centre, but there it is. Back in 2020, there was reasonably high levels of support for Russia amongst voters who voted for some of these parties. Often that was because Russia presented itself as a cultural counterpoint to an international liberal agenda. But that doesn't mean these voters were willing to ignore the invasion of Ukraine. Support among Forza Italia voters dropped from 67% to 18 to give just one example. This doesn't necessarily mean that all of these parties have fully changed their views towards Russia, but it does mean that their voters have. And that certainly doesn't help Russia's campaign to build influence in Europe and break apart opposing alliances. So in essence, Russia has wrecked their economy, their military, and their influence around the world in order to prop up American influence, encourage Ukrainian nationalism, drive NATO expansion and rearmament, and comprehensively destroy the areas of Ukraine it set out to, quote, save. And all of that is in a hypothetical scenario where Russia wins. Because that was a best case scenario. That was a scenario where Russia gets to keep Zaporizhia and Kherson and Donetsk and Luhansk, which is pretty impressive considering they don't currently fully control any of those regions. It's a world in which Ukraine never joins NATO, never joins the European Union. And while I don't claim to predict how this war will end, that seems incredibly unlikely. The reasons for that are myriad. You could argue it's because Russian military advances when they currently happen are usually measured in metres, not in dozens of kilometres. Yevgeny Prigozhin himself has come out and said it'll probably take Russia literal years just to take the Donbass, so to say nothing of reclaiming Kherson or taking Zaporizhia. If you assume the only way for Russia to win, and I think the only way for Russia to win is for the Western countries to pull their military and economic support for Ukraine, well that's much less likely in a universe where Russia is pursuing maximal war aims. If Russia says, hey, we will go home if you pinky promise to never join NATO, 
then a lot of Western countries would go to Kiev and go, hey, do you want to at least consider that one? But if Russia says we're going to annex swaths of Ukrainian territory, enforce neutrality, and then probably have another go at Ukraine in a number of years, well, in terms of both strategic terms and in terms of politics, that's going to be really unpalatable to a lot of Western leaders. It'll be much cheaper, politically and economically, to just keep up support, and similarly, Ukrainian resistance too. So taken together, I'd suggest the chances of Russia quickly and efficiently achieving its maximal war goals are about the same odds as this video has of having a 100% like ratio. Hypothetically possible, but I would bet my life savings against it. And yet, the longer the war goes on in pursuit of those maximal objectives, the more destabilised and tired Russia will become. I've said before that Russia has the financial and military resources to carry on this conflict for some time, but those resources aren't infinite. And with every ruble spent and every bunker emptied of its stored ammunition or hardware, Russia will become that little bit weaker. That doesn't mean, of course, that the Russian Federation is likely to immediately collapse. I don't even think, for most Western strategists, that's even a goal. I think it's a terrifying concept to most of them. The potential of thousands of loose nukes and global economic disruption isn't particularly high on anyone's priority list. But just because it doesn't collapse doesn't mean its strategic influence, its position in the world, isn't diminished. A Russia that comes out of this war, even a Russia that wins this war according to its own definition, is more isolated, poorer, and weaker. It's a country more isolated than ever from its former primary market, the European Union, a market it will never get back, and one that is more dependent than ever on Beijing's support. Now, if you listen to the first part of this presentation, you might think that that sounds a little bit doom and gloom on Russia's future. After all, you might argue, Perun, Russia has always bounced back in the past, hasn't it? The Russian Empire survived an enormous number of reverses before it finally collapsed, and also the Soviet Union, it survived the German invasion and was able to rebuild itself into a global power. By comparison to the destruction of World War I or the Second World War, there's no comparison to the war that's currently being fought in Ukraine. So why shouldn't we expect Russia to just rebuild itself back up to great power status yet again? The answer is that there's only so many times you can come back from the dead, and the world has changed. In the past, Russia always rebounded from defeat on the back of certain advantages. Its demography, its resources, its landmass. In relative terms compared to other countries, those have all eroded. The Russian Empire and later the Soviet Union used to have a considerably larger population than the United States. Now Russia is in the midst of deep demographic decay. There aren't enough children being born to maintain the workforce, and many of Russia's most talented go overseas and find jobs elsewhere. In Western countries with low fertility rates, the answer is often mass migration, which brings in working-age people from other countries to fill out the demographic pyramid and keep the economy growing. That has been the US secret for decades. But there is no mass migration into the Russian Federation. Other countries are moving into industrial and economic areas that it used to dominate. Other countries produce oil and gas as well, and many of them do it considerably cheaper. And in terms of military power and influence, Russia's strength relative to both its European and also its Asian neighbours is continuing to decline. Europe, Japan, China, these are all countries that are launching major rearmament programs. And all Russia will have to counterbalance that is whatever is left over after the war in Ukraine finishes. Some form of Russian recovery is entirely possible, even likely. But a move that causes them to rejoin the United States or the People's Republic of China in great power status well, that's about as likely as me being elected mayor of Moscow. The old regenerative capacity just isn't there anymore. Russia has coasted for decades on its inheritance from the Soviet Union. Putin bet the inheritance on the war in Ukraine, and is about to lose it all. And yet, despite all of those strategic realities, I think it is more than likely that this war is going to go on for some time yet. On one hand, it will continue because the Russian political elite can't afford for it not to continue. Pulling out of Ukraine without achieving all of Russia's stated objectives, without taking those four regions, would be seen everywhere, especially within Russia, as a defeat. Military defeat is historically an extremely dangerous experience for governments in Russia and other countries like it. People look for someone to blame, they look for an answer as to why people were killed or wounded or the economy ruined, if in the end it didn't even change things. So anything short of complete military victory probably moves an awful lot of Russian influential people that much closer to an 18th story window. But as long as the war is still going, well, you haven't lost.
People can still be told that they have to rally around the flag for the sake of the war effort. Martial law can remain in place, controls over the media can remain in place, and any attempt to unseat those in power can be painted as someone undermining the war effort. Even if it's ultimately a doomed effort, keeping the war going may be essential to keeping people in power. And much more importantly, just because Russia has suffered a strategic defeat doesn't mean that Ukraine's fate has been decided. War isn't necessarily a win-lose game. It's possible to have both participants lose on net. And while it's pretty clear that Russia will come out of this in a worse strategic situation than it went in, Ukraine and its allies are still very much fighting for its future. At one extreme, for example, there exists a scenario where Ukraine regains all of its sovereign territory. It secures a recognition of its territorial integrity and its sovereignty. It's free to apply to join NATO and put itself on the path to European Union membership. It receives reconstruction funding and modernization assistance from the West, and it builds itself into a part of the European security and economic infrastructure. Even in that scenario, Ukraine will be deeply wounded. It will have lost people, a lot of people. Its infrastructure will have suffered extreme damage. There will be a trauma that sits with its population potentially for a generation. But based on the conversations I've had, I'm convinced that most Ukrainians would look at that outcome and call it victory. At the other end of the spectrum, there's a scenario in which nothing is solved, the conflict is frozen, and Ukraine is left with all of these casualties and damage, knowing that it's just going to have to do it all again in a couple of years. That scenario may not be considered a victory for Russia, but I'd hardly call it a win for Ukraine either. I think it's almost certain that leaders in the West and in Kyiv know exactly that. They know that how this war ends matters. And while the media tends to focus on who's gained how many metres in the Donbass day to day or week to week, I have to hope that political leaders know better. That the strategic implications of this conflict stretch well beyond military control of metres of territory in the east of Ukraine. And it's also why I would probably bet that Ukraine's soldiers will continue to fight on. Despite casualties, despite hard conditions, despite the might of the Russian army that opposes them. Because while Russia has already, almost from the moment it stepped into Ukraine, suffered a strategic defeat, the fighting to come will determine whether Ukraine does as well, or finds at the end of the tunnel something that deserves to be called victory. In conclusion, Russia has a long history of being a great power and an empire. Whether it was during the Russian Empire or the Soviet Union, it was the same basic resources in many cases that helped build Russian influence in power. And it was often the same sort of mistakes that brought those empires down. And in Ukraine, they presented themselves once again. Corruption, overconfidence, overextension, and an inability to understand that the Finns, the Bolts, the Poles and the Ukrainians don't want to be Russians, they want to be Finns, Bolts, Poles and Ukrainians. However the fight in Ukraine now ends, Russia will have failed to achieve the majority of its strategic objectives. Whether judged by the Pranakov Doctrine or the objectives that Putin himself set out, even military victory for Russia now would represent a strategic defeat. But while that's important context for analysing and understanding the war, it's equally important to understand that Ukraine's fate has not yet been decided. By most strategic measures, Russia may already have lost. But it'll be up to the Ukrainians, the West, and the fortunes of war to determine whether or not Ukraine wins. All right, channel update to close out. And I know this one was a pretty heavy one that'll probably attract a couple of comments. I thought long and hard about doing this video, but here's the reason I ultimately decided to go with it. In the coming days, I expect a very crowded information environment. Every network out there is probably going to be giving their summation of the fighting in Ukraine and their predictions for 2023. The problem with doing that is I expect there'll be a lot of significant developments over the course of the anniversary, March and even April. So if I do give a summary of the fighting, I want to wait until those developments have shaken out. But even if that wasn't the case, I think it's important to take a moment and zoom out. It's easy to get lost in studying the fighting, the battle map, the casualties or individual developments. But after a year of hard fighting, what I really wanted to do was zoom out and look at this war on the strategic scale. And I wanted to make the argument that even if Russia still maintains significant military capacity, even if it can still launch offensive campaigns, it doesn't take away from the fact that this war has been a disaster not just for the Ukrainian people, but also for the very country that chose to launch this war. To move away from Ukraine then, I want to extend uh, my commiserations and best wishes to all of those who have recently been affected by earthquakes, and also to the rescuers and emergency services that are engaged in saving those they can.
For my part, given what I expect of the information environment next week, I'm going to try and offer up something a little more lighthearted, a return to some Defence 101 concepts, and an exploration of how smaller countries, not just superpowers, can build a military capable of defending themselves. Thank you very much all for your support, and I will see you all again next week.